Welcome to Food and Facilities, an online show for West Coast Industrial Solutions Magazine. Our goal is to cultivate knowledge to feed the world by focusing our quarterly trade issues on safety, compliance, and innovation within manufacturing, agriculture, food processing, and food and beverage industries. In this episode, I spoke with Issa Robbins of Forge Kitchen to discuss how their commissary, kitchen, cafe, and event space in Oakland, California has been supporting food entrepreneurs in their community throughout the pandemic. Facilities. I'm Tara Sweeney, the Marketing Director for West Coast Industrial Solutions Magazine. And today we'll be discussing the local food economy evolving in a global pandemic with Forage Kitchen. Make sure to subscribe at wcismag.com forward slash subscribe for all the news involving manufacturing, food and beverage, food processing, and agriculture. And this upcoming Thursday, December 10th, the Weeb Hinton and Hamblick LLP will be hosting a 2020 family business tax update for the next year. They'll be covering the CARES Act, loan forgiveness, how to minimize your liability, and compliance assistance. So go to the Institute of Family Businesses Facebook and RSVP today. One of our sponsors is Fine Print Plus. They're your source for print, packing, and promotion. They have 500 free business cards with purchase for new customers if you mention this ad. They do graphic design, print and copies, custom apparel, promotional items, a parcel service, and they just recently started a will call and delivery service. You can reach them at 559-237-4747. You can give them an email at graphics, G-R-A-P-H-I-C-S, at Fine Print Plus, F I N E P R I N T P L U S dot com, or you can request a quote at their website at fineprintplus.com forward slash quote. And my guest today will be Iso Rabbins, co founder of Forage Kitchen. You can reach him at Iso, I S O, at Forage Kitchen, F O R A G E K I T C H E N dot com. Or you can give him a call at 415-379-0590. I'm here with my guest, Isa Rabbins of Forage Kitchen, and he's going to be sharing with us some background information on Forage and what they do. Isa? Uh, cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm Isa from Forage Kitchen, and um, we are uh, an incubator space for food companies, so like a commissary kitchen where people, everything from caterers to people who make small products to sell like specialty stores uh, can run their business. And we also, we kind of have like a lot of things going on. Um, we also do co-packing, so we co-pack people's products. So it's really a nice funnel, like people will come in making their own product, and then at a certain point they need a co-packer. So it's a really nice um, like situation to have that internally. We also have a German beer garden called Hofkuka that we run out of here, which is pretty fun. And uh, what else do we do? We do lots of events. So we do like, before all the craziness, we did this thing first Friday, which was like this really fun big event. We get like 1500 people and there's food, music and drinks. And that would also be another opportunity for the people who were using the kitchen to be able to kind of like get the word out about their stuff and sell their products. So like as much as possible, we try to use, like we try to promote the people in the kitchen as much as we can through our social media and our email list and different events we're doing. And that's, uh, that's about what we got going on here. And Forage is an amazing resource, especially because it's so hard to get into food entrepreneurship and then you're helping all of the food and beverage entrepreneurs locally, which is really great. Mm, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a fun project. So what are some other projects that you do on the side that kind of led you to Forage? Well, I own another business called Forage SF that I started in 09. And 
I did kind of a lot of stuff with that. It first started as a wild food CSA box. So kind of like a meal kit of all wild foraged food. And from there, I wanted to be cooking more. I started kind of coming up with recipes of all this different like wild forage things I found, seaweeds and mushrooms and what have you. And so I started um, doing underground dinners, uh, kind of like underground supper club called the Wild Wild Kitchen. And, um, and I ran that for about six years and that grew up from like 40 people to like 100 person eight course tasting menus. We did them a couple times a month for a long time. And we do them in like warehouses and rooftops and houseboats and stuff like that. Um, but during that time, I started using these shared kitchens. <clears throat> like I used, like I, I used like kind of commissaries all over the all over the city, and I really just saw like the things that really were working with them and really weren't working with them, and and how like often like pretty subtle management issues were the reason that like there was a lot of infighting in the kitchen people were like just at each other's throats all the time you know kind of just like that classic like chef yelling at each other thing um but i really realized it's like it's just because they're like the place was dirty or the oven didn't work so then people are going to get in a fight with each other if they don't know what table they're going to be using um so i wanted to kind of start a space that was the space i wish i really had um so that was kind of like the motivation for that i also so after well, during the time that I was doing the Wild Kitchen, I also started this event called the Underground Market, which was like, um, it was a big incubator event for food company, like startup small food businesses. So the idea was that you didn't have to have any of your permits to sell to the public because it was technically a private event. Um, and we would get, we do those monthly and we'd have about a hundred vendors in there and we get a couple thousand people. So it was a really nice way to, for people who are like really just starting out who really weren't sure what we got were a lot of people from other industries and especially like after 08, you know, like the whole world disappeared, kind of like it's happening again right now. Um, but what I noticed is a lot of people kind of took it as an opportunity to switch from something maybe they weren't really enjoying anyway, you know, really took it as like kind of a, a time to let their creative juices flow. Um, so that event was like a nice, like, um, kind of a nice springboard for them. And the, and what I also realized during that event is like there weren't enough commissaries for these people to go to. Um, so it was kind of another motivation to start my own. And we did a Kickstarter for it and raised about 150 grand a while back. And that pretty much brings us to here. I still own Forage SF. And what Forage SF does mainly now is uh, teach us foraging classes. So take you like mushroom foraging and seaweed foraging all over Northern California. And we actually, because of COVID, did start again doing a wild food CSA box. So we do like, um, call it forage box. It's like a subscription box of all wild mushrooms and different wild forage foods. So kind of like a lot of stuff in like food, food entrepreneurship brought me to the place that I am now. Could you give us a little more information on your membership structure at Forage Kitchen? Yeah, totally. So we kind of have a three tiered structure, we call it pairing santoku and chef membership and the idea is you pay for a uh, like a minimum number of hours at the beginning of the month so the pairing for example is like really the entryway membership you prepay for 20 hours at uh 28 an hour and then any hours you use over that excuse me you uh you pay at that rate so you're paying 20 dollars an hour you know forever um and then the Santoku is um, yeah, $25. $25 an hour and you get 40 hours, you prepay for 40. Chef's is $21 an hour and you prepay for 80. So, you know, it's like, what we want to do is give people kind of like different entry points. And then what we do is we allow like quarterly, we allow people to change memberships. So they're not locked in, into that one membership forever. So kind of as their business grows, they can get that lower rate. Um, we do rent, Sometimes just for people like just need it for a couple days and it's a little random what we charge for that. I mean, we charge like significantly more just because it's a kind of a hassle to have like get, it, get their permits and insurance and everything for them to just be there for a couple days. So we try to, we always try to price that so people won't do it. Um, really try to push people into membership. Uh, and we also rent the space. Another thing we do is we rent the space for for private events and weddings. Like we just had a film shoot here the other day. So that's like another really nice source of income. Cause I think the like, 
like the kitchen itself, like the people who use a space like this, like almost by definition, can't pay enough to support it, right? Because like they're just starting out and it costs like an insane amount of money to build out a commissary kitchen. So what we try to do is like, I think of them as like kind of the heart of the business and everything around kind of like supports that heart. So we have all these like other income streams. So we've tried to be as creative as we can about like getting people to have their weddings here, doing our own events, having a cafe. Um, and in that way it can kind of be a more sustainable business. Definitely. And then can you give us a little more information on how the commissary is set up and what kind of equipment you offer? Yeah, we have all the regular stuff. We got a tilt skillet, stock pot burners, six burner stoves, um, steam kettle, grill. Uh, got rotisserie down there, which is pretty cool. What else do we have? convection ovens, two double stack convection ovens. So it's like a nice, you know, it's a nice line. It's not like really like a specialty line. You know, we were thinking about putting in a, like a big bread oven at one point. But what we really kind of created this space is like a space where pretty much any kind of business can use what they, you know, a baker can come in and use convection ovens and we do have bakers that come and do that. And then when they're ready to really have their own space and get their own space with a big bread oven. Um, we have seven stations. So the thing people really reserve are the stations. So we built out this app where they go on and they can kind of see a layout of, of the entire space. And they choose the station, choose their day and time. Um, and by doing that, we also stop the kind of infighting about people arguing about which table is theirs at what moment. It's like all on the computer. Like, so there's never any uh, like disagreement about that, which is really nice. Uh, we have a cafe in the front. So like, our whole commissary is in the back and we have a cafe here that serves food and drinks. And then also outside we have a big parking lot and patio that turns into like an outdoor beer garden at night. And you also offer small batch co-packing. Can you specify what exactly those types of small batches are you're capable of supporting? Yeah, totally. It's pretty varied. Like we've done a lot of hot sauce. Seems like a lot of people get hot sauce bottled. Um, we did a lot of bone broth, like um, chicken broth and beef broth for a long time. Some jam, we did jam at one point. Um, furikake, which is like, uh, it's like a sesame seaweed mix. We did that for one woman. So it's, a, it's pretty varied. You know, it's been a little, it's been an interesting learning experience with the, with the co-packing. Like it was an idea that we came up with because it just seems like it just seems to make so much sense. Like we have this space that's never going to be full 24 or seven, right? There's always going to be off time. So it's like, we want to use the space as efficiently as possible. And also we have this population of people coming in that will eventually need co-packing. Um, so it just made a lot of sense to try to start that project. And, and we looked around and like, there weren't many co-packers that served like people who were kind of like just out of doing their own production, you know, like people didn't need, a hundred thousand units of something. Um, so we thought it was like this really interesting sweet spot. Uh, none of us had any experience with like uh, a consumer packaged good production at all, you know, so it was kind of like a pretty steep learning curve. And if I'm being super candid, like I like to be honest about this stuff, like if I, I it was good because it helped support the business when it needed support financially, but it's really a hassle. And like, it doesn't, it's really not worth it. Um, and I think there's a reason that there aren't more co-packers at this level, because like the, the amount of time you have to spend to like scale up to figure out someone's products. And then especially with people at this level, like they probably been making it at home mostly, or they make it some in the kitchen. So they have a very specific way they need it. They have very specific fresh ingredients they want to use. So like using fresh ingredients with co-packing is really hard. And no one wants to switch out their ingredients for like acidified ingredients. So it's, it's just, it's, I understand why there are like, is not more of a market serving this niche? Because it's really, it's kind of intense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then a lot of the members also sell their products in your cafe. Can you give a little more information about your cafe? Yeah, totally. So the cafe, so up until a couple months ago, what we did was these kind of like long-term pop-ups. So the idea was to provide a space for people who wanted to start a restaurant 
but like didn't necessarily have the capital right now or the experience to build out their own. Um, so we kind of like offered the space for rent. And we had, we had a, a good run of people. We had this guy doing barbecue there for like a year who then moved out and got his own space. We just had, um, we're coming to the shawarma that started our space and just got their own space too. So it's been a nice like launching pad for a lot of businesses. And then when COVID kind of hit, we realized we really need to run our own thing. Um, and it was perfect because the shawarma guy had actually just found his own space already. Um, so we opened a uh, German beer garden. So we had like German beer and food and sausages and schnitzel and all kinds of stuff like that. And it's really nice right now too, because no one can be inside and we have this beautiful outdoor space. So it's actually, it's pretty lucky. Um, but we also have a shelf in there where we sell the products of the people in the kitchen. So like spices and hot sauces and all kinds of stuff up there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and the idea is like, when I, when I kind of like thought about the space designing the space, like I feel like most of these kinds of spaces are these kind of like black boxes that no one, unless you are a professional can ever even see into. You can never, you never go into a commissary or a commercial kitchen unless you work in the food industry. And what I wanted to do is create the space that's kind of like a little bit more porous. I mean, so like we have big windows and also they're generally like really unpleasant places to be, you know, and like in basements, like for like for us and buzzing lights and just kind of horrible. So I wanted to create a space that's actually pleasant to be in and people can see into. So, you know, big skylights, big windows and the cafes in front and then the, the back of the cafe is actually open. So you can see back into the kitchen. So people come to the cafe and they can see people working. And that's a way to kind of, I find to make people more comfortable with the idea that like maybe they could work in that space if they can see into it. Um, cause we get a lot of people who don't have like a long food world background or like always dreamed of starting their own food business. Didn't really feel comfortable, um, kind of getting into the industry. And I think what we try to do as much as possible is like, just be really welcoming to people and really open and kind of like answer people's questions. Cause I know at least for me, like when I started doing, when I started using a kitchen, I didn't, I hadn't worked in a professional kitchen ever before. And it's like pretty intimidating. You know, like everyone's, there's all these words you don't know. Everyone's like moving around really fast. There's all this equipment that's like way bigger than anything you've ever seen. Um, so I think as much as possible, we try to like, kind of like nurture people through that transition and that kind of openness of the space, I feel like is uh, kind of an important part of it. Yeah. And then you also hosted events and stuff at the beer garden area before COVID? Yeah, so we did that first Friday when I was talking about, uh, but we also rent, rent it for weddings. We had a lot of weddings booked actually. We've been like trying to ramp up our wedding booking business for a couple of years and it like it just arrived. We had like all these weddings booked this summer and then just obviously all gone, which is too bad. But I think it's, it was a good opportunity to kind of like switch courses with the cafe. Um, so we have that out there now, but yeah, before it was like first Fridays, weddings, and then we do like, people would approach us about like what craft fairs they wanted to do, like performance art pieces they might want to do. What else do we do? We had movie nights, which we're actually starting again soon, where we'd have this like big 20 foot inflatable screen and we'd show movies on. We had a lot of music, like live music, with, like local bands would play all the time, which was really fun. Uh, we're starting to do, we're starting to start the music back up again and the uh, movies back up again. And we're starting to do trivia too, which would be fun. You know, so it's just like, because we have this nice outdoor space. So like any chance to kind of get people together outside is positive right now. I think. And then what are some future plans you have for Forge Kitchen? Uh, keep it going. I don't know. Um, I mean, I feel like at this point, it's like, at this point, it's just like a little bit in survival mode, right? Like just trying to keep the lights on. Like our business dropped you know, 90% in March, like almost disappeared, you know? So it was like getting the PPP money and the EIDL loan really helps. Uh, and now it's actually ramping back up to almost where we were before, which is really nice. Um, but I don't know, I mean, I think the, I think kind of turning into more of a space for like the direct community in our area. So like more events that pull people live around here, I think is, is a focus. Uh, I won't open another one of these, you know, um, but it was a good, it's a good experience to have had. Um, but I think for me, it's, 
getting it to run well and then kind of letting it run on its own is the, the kind of direction that we're moving right now. Well, thank you for taking time to talk with me. If you would like to reach out to ESO and the other founders at Forage Kitchen, you can go to Forage Kitchen, F-O-R-A-G-E-K-I-T-C-H-E-N.com or give them a call at 415-379-0590. Make sure to reach out to Issa Robbins if you have any questions about his services at Forge Kitchen. And one of our sponsors is California League of Food Producers. You can visit them at clfp.com for more information or give them a call at 916-640-8150. They're going to help bring California's goodness to the world through labor laws, water regulation, Proposition 65, labeling requirements, regulating chemicals, drinking water, transportation, greenhouse gas, and cap and trade. Another one of our sponsors is Dynamic Coatings Incorporated. They're a concrete restoration and flooring solution. They offer seamless, antimicrobial, durable, dustproof, and fast cure sealants. You can give them a call at their Sacramento location at 916-485-6800, their Oakland location at 510 510- 352-7000, their Fresno location at 559-225-4605, and their Los Angeles location at 562-634-9887. And now we will have a moment of silence for our Black Lives Matter community.